In this video, I'm going to redo a calculation that I've actually already done for you, and that is the derivation of the ultra-relativistic limit of the BABA differential scattering cross-section, but this time I'm going to do it using a new method, the spinner helicity formalism. And the point of this is to show you the derivation of a result that we've already derived via standard techniques so that you can then compare between the standard method and simplification via the spinner helicity formalism. What we'll see is that even when the only thing offered by using spinner helicity variables is faster simplification pathways, it still is a big difference. Of course, as you go on in the spinner helicity formalism, depending on what it is that you're deriving, there can be really fast theorems and formulas that'll cut you past using Feynman rules at all in some cases. It's also great to work through familiar old calculations with a new method as simple practice. Now, of course, spinner helicity variables come in when we're messing around with the Feynman amplitude, so we would expect to start with the same differential scattering cross-section, and that's nearly true. True. The only thing we need to change for this calculation is the normalization. Before we performed the calculation for the massive case, observed the cancellation of the overall factors of mass, and then took the ultra-relativistic limit without any kind of a problem. Here, we can't exactly do that because we're calculating this Feynman amplitude square in the massless case to begin with which really wouldn't work because uh, if we look here, not knowing what's going on in there, we might think that setting mass equal to zero would just set this straight up equal to zero. So it really is worth changing normalization instead of trying to figure out how we could make that work as is. And that's pretty easy. We can just switch to the normalization that I typically use for bosons. It's standard for bosons. And that would give us this scattering cross-section. Now I'm going to save actually setting the mass equal to zero until a step or two later, because if we just leave it here, we can leverage all the simplification we did in that original video. Link in the description to that, by the way. I forgot to mention that. And that gets us here. And then after that, we'll set mass equal to zero. So basically, for the parts of the calculation that don't change, we want to leverage as much as we can the work that we've already done to speed it up. With the mass equal to zero, though, we get this simplified result. And with that, we're ready to focus on the Feynman amplitude. These are the usual Feynman diagrams. If you look back at that past video, you'll notice that I call the outgoing ones P1 prime and P2 prime. For this video, I've switched to P3 and P4 because that plays nicer with the spinner helicity notation. Of course, the actual baseline Feynman rules don't change. We still are working with those. I've set the mass equal to zero in all places where it explicitly showed up, which is just this one. That was somewhat of a meaningless thing to do, though, because we don't actually need the fermion propagator for this case. We just have the photon propagator, which is always massless. Looking at those Feynman diagrams and these Feynman rules, we have this Feynman amplitude there. We can immediately start simplifying it a little bit by pulling out some factors of constants and writing the two denominators conveniently in terms of these Mandelstam variables. And with that, we are reminded of where the name S channel and T channel come from, as you may have seen before. And at this point, we're ready to start transitioning to spinner helicity variables for the simplification of all these complicated matrix factors. I've written out in a table here the translation to spinner helicity variables that we're going to be applying. We'll have to handle this calculation one helicity combination at a time, but that doesn't actually have to take too long once you see the patterns, as I'll show you. Now, as I go, I'm going to simplify using the Fears identity and using this flipping identity. I'm also going to use the anti-symmetric properties of the brackets here, the angle and the square brackets, which both satisfy that property. Now I've constructed another table here to help us. First we have the four pluses configuration. We see that that yields a non-zero contribution in both cases. When we flip just one to minus, we see that it's yielding zero because we get the same kind of bracket on either side of the gamma matrices. And if you remember how the abusive notation works in this case, we have a four by four matrix here that has sigma matrices in it, while sigma mu matrices in it. And then we have four by four components, two of which are zero. And if you look at the way that aligns, gammas sandwiched between same types of brackets 
is always zero. So we see that for both the S and the T channel here. Scrolling down, we see that that trend continues for the other one minus cases. For the first two minus case, we see that we actually get another non-zero contribution, at least when it aligns right for the S channel. It doesn't align right for the T channel, and we still get zero. In fact, we get two factors of zero this time. In the case of this two minuses configuration, it doesn't align correctly for the S channel, but does for the T channel. Then we get a couple of two minuses, two pluses cases, where it doesn't align correctly for either T or S channel, and they're both zero. Then we get another case where one of them works and the other doesn't, and then the other one works and one of them doesn't. Then, of course, we've got the one pluses cases, which all vanish for the same reason as all these one minuses cases, before we finally get down to the all minuses cases, which is, of course, non-zero, like the all pluses case was. Note that this process doesn't actually have to take very long, because there are a lot of zeros and they follow a certain kind of pattern. And once you notice that, you can pretty quickly write out the cases that are non-zero. To make things even easier, you can remember that crossing symmetry is going to allow us to ignore half of these diagrams. And with that sorted, we can start inserting our simplified results here back into the Feynman amplitude, and then we can square one helicity combination at a time before summing to get the unpolarized result. We need this complex conjugation formula to do that because we're taking modulus squares, and then it's also quite useful to have this identity which is specific to four particle kinematics. Let's get going. The all pluses case ultimately gives us this when we apply the complex conjugation formula. After that we can multiply out and then use the anti-symmetry properties here to actually get rid of this minus sign, and then we can use that four-particle kinematics-reliant identity to write everything in terms of one four brackets. We ultimately get this rather simple result. The other two cases that we need to consider are even simpler because there's just one term, and again we can use that same, or rather a version, of that four-particle kinematics-reliant identity to write these in terms of simple squares. From here we can realize that in accordance with usual identity, these combinations of brackets that we're getting are actually equal to individual Mandelstam variables, as you can see I've written out here. That ultimately gives us these very elegant results, and now we're ready to sum them to get the unpolarized amplitude squared. We can then insert that back into the differential scattering cross-section we had above. That gets us here, and from there we can transition to the usual parameterization that I expressed everything in terms of in the last video to get what will hopefully turn out to be the same result as last time. Specializing to the ultra-relativistic limit, this is the same parameterization we used last time, which gives us these values for the Mandelstam variables. If we insert them in, well, for one thing, we can express this even more completely in terms of Mandelstam variables. That S shows up there. But more importantly, we can start inserting in and simplifying, and we do in fact get out the desired famous result exactly as we had it in the last video. One other thing I want to comment on, at least at the time of the recording of this video, if you look up Baba scattering on Wikipedia, you'll find a formula very similar to this, but with a pi in the numerator and no 2 in the denominator. That's because they integrated over the d phi part of the solid angle, so you'll see d sigma over d cosine theta, and that gives you a 2 pi factor over here, which cancels the 2 and gives you a pi there, just in case you were confused by that. I hope this video was interesting. Thanks for watching.